your extended family. I like that. <laughs> I'm really not here to endorse anybody. I wouldn't do to that uh, to anybody, especially somebody I like as much as Anthem. <laughs> I just have a couple of things I'd like to, uh, you to think about as this race proceeds and as we all get focused. And this applies to all the candidates, by the way. I just wanted to uh, talk to you about um, your neighbors. Now, the fact that you are here is a really good sign. It means there's something wrong with you. Um, <laughs> because most of your friends and neighbors and colleagues have checked out of the political realm. They're, they're dropouts here at the moment. It's not because they are without opinions or that they're without concern. There's something else going on to, with them right now. Right now, print media is suffering, broadcast media is suffering, uh, even some of the social media is suffering, and once the suffering is probably overstating it. But people have turned away from sources of information, not because they don't like information, as they say, hey, I, there's nothing I can do about how crummy things are at the moment, and I can't deal with any more bad news, so I'm going to go think about something else for a while. Let me give you an example of how this works. One of my favorite things is, uh, my wife got me into this, is uh, watching MMA fighting. She was attracted to it first, and then got me hooked. I'm pretty sure that's how I remember it anyway. One of my favorite fighters is uh, a fellow by the name of John Bones Jones. He is a light heavyweight fighter, and he is an athletic marvel. He's one of the best athletes on the planet and one of the best uh, MMA wrestlers on the, the fighters on the planet. And he has uh, owned that title for quite a while, much longer than you'd usually expect. And one of his last fights was really, really, really hard. I mean, he got beat up. Uh, he, his face was all tore up. His, his mouth was bloody. He had a couple of cuts on his face. His, his ribs were bruised. He didn't win the fight by uh, uh, making the other person submit or by knocking them out. They just went to the full end of the five rounds and then the judge decided on the basis of points that John Bones Jones had won. Now, no fighter wants to win that way, but it's better than losing that way. And he was embarrassed because he'd been beat on like that. And he was embarrassed that he didn't win the fight outright. And at the end of the fight, the usual process is a guy named Joe Rogan comes up to you with a microphone in his hand and debriefs you and talks to you about the fight, talks about your aspirations for the next fight and who you want to fight next. Well, John Bones Jones walked up. He could barely move. He had to be propped up by, by his buddies. And you could see him bleeding profusely, and he was bent over in pain, and he was looking at his big toe, which was broken in a terrible angle, pointed in a direction that big toes are never supposed to point, hanging by a thread of his skin, and all he could do was just kind of stand there, and Rogan was asking him questions about, oh, what about that move here? And uh, what about the next, what about your career? And all of the, that uh, John Bones could do was just barely stand up, and his body was almost in shock, and finally Rogan gave up in trying to communicate with him. He realized what was going on. And Rogan just stumbles out of sight. All he could do was feel his immediate fear and pain. The fear that he may never fight again, and the pain that was throbbing from all parts of his body. Well, that's the state of our electorate right now. They're so scared that our broken economy cannot be fixed and that our broken culture is terminal, and all they can do is focus on their own pain and fear. So what they do, rather than plan for the future, is they distract themselves with, with drugs, or alcohol, or television, or sports, or fishing, or anything that's even, or even religion, or anything. Anything other than the pain that our culture is in at the moment. Well, that makes running for office at this time in our history extraordinarily difficult. And most politicians, and not this time around, just most of the time, all they do is come home and describe the problem and how bad it is and rehearse how bad and how crummy things are. We know how crummy things are. We don't have to be told. So what we're looking for is a politician or a statesman or whomever to tell us how they're going to fix it. 
<laughs> and so, well, have we ever been this way before in our history? Uh, many times we've been here before in our history. I'm thinking of 1816, Thomas Jefferson wrote this. If we run into such debts as that we must be taxed in our meat, in our drink, in our necessaries, uh, necessities, that is, for our modern ears, and our comforts, in our labors, in our amusements, and for our callings and creeds, as the people of England are, our people, just like those guys, must come to labor 16 hours a day in the 24 and give the earnings of 15 of these to the government for their debts and their daily expenses. And the 16th being insufficient for us to buy our bread, we must live as they do on oatmeal and potatoes and have no time to think. That's a big deal. You have to work all that time. You never have time to think. You can't even think about solutions to your problems. No means of calling the mismanagers to account, but would be glad to obtain subsistence by hiring ourselves out to rivet our own chains. The bulk of society is therefore reduced to mere automatons of misery, having no sensitivities left, but for sinning and suffering. Yeah, we've been here, they were there. It's happened two or three times in our history, just like that. That's why I'm here tonight. Because there are only a handful of people uh, that I know in the political class, in our immediate influence, that have the skill sets to deal with a time like this. A handful. Most of them are posers, wannabes, and people who think they can buy access to the political process on 30 second commercials. Very few have given it the candle power that these problems need to be uh, addressed. We need to, right now, our leaders who can acknowledge that as an economy and as a culture, we are indeed in deep Shinola. While at the same time, these same people with clarity and optimism can say what needs to be done to restore the American dream. And as I said, I can count people like that in one hand. Sam is on that list. I, I would have put Louis Gohmert on that list, and, but according to what I've recently found out, he's really buddies with Eric Holder. And, and, <laughs> Well, you don't know about uh, Congressman Gomer from Texas. He uh, he's trained in law school. Uh, he's a brilliant lawyer. He went off and uh, was a judge for a while, and then uh, he taught. He began to teach Sunday school at a Baptist church, which meant he actually had to start reading the Bible. <laughs> and when he got to the part "Thou shalt not judge," he just quit. Right. <laughs> so he became a well, Congressman. <laughs> say anything, thou shalt not be a congressman, so <laughs> we're going to, uh, I, my job to introduce Steve King. He doesn't need an introduction, he is one of my, he's also on that same hand, which means I only have two fingers left. <laughs> and he is a fearless advocate of everything that needs an advocate. And, and he is also PC which means pretty cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs>